Hi there, this is your Professor Joseph. Welcome. Um, today we're going to be viewing, reviewing um, your final exam, which is Chapter 6. We will not be including 6.5 in this video. Um, if your final exam has 6.5 in it, just go back and look at that section where I actually have a video on it. Um, but for this, we're just covering 1, 2, 3, 4, and Sections 6. So everything but 5, or 6.5. So this format may look a little different. Again, this is a mock exam. If you're taking my class and you're using MindTap, you're going to have different kind of um, structure here, but the same content. So here we go. I'm just going to go through these pretty quickly. You can pause the video at each one, try to work it out yourself. Then I'll give you the answer. Um, but simply with this first section here, you're just going to be translating. Okay. So when you do that, you're going to be looking for trigger words like either, and, or, because you know with either, or, you're going to have the wedge symbol with and, or but, you know, there's a few others, you're going to have the dot. Um, if you have if, then, so you're going to have, you know, the um, uh, conditional sign. If you have if and only if, or necessary and sufficient, you're going to have the triple bar. Again, this is review. On top of review, because you could look at my previous videos for each section and see this very thing. If you have a tilde, it means not or a negation. So the biggest uh, struggle for some of you will just be, where do the parentheses go? Sometimes um, they make it easy for you. They'll literally put a comma right there, and you'll see, oh, okay. Um, sometimes you won't have a comma. Sometimes you'll have semicolons. But if you read something and, and you feel like it's, it seems like there's a pause in the sentence, maybe that's where, you know, implicitly a comma would go. So maybe that's where parentheses would go. So let's look at one. So either uh, Bretling has a diamond model or Rado advertises a calendar watch. Seems like there's a pause there. Then it says, or Tizzo has luminous hands. So it seems like this or, which is a wedge T for Tizzo, is kind of hanging on the outside. And it seems like there's one that hangs on the outside. And let's check what's in the parentheses. Bretling has a diamond model and Rado. So B dot R, B dot R. And we have the either. So it's kind of like either this or that. So how many of you had C? C's correct answer. Okay, so, and you could rule some of these out right away because for example, Bretling has a diamond model and Rado. It's not Bretling has a diamond model or Rado. So you're going to want to see a B dot R, not B wedge R. There's a B wedge R, B wedge R. So B dot R, B dot R. So you know it's going to be C through E. Those are your choices. And C is the best candidate because we've identified it. Kind of looks like there's a pause right there. And that looks like a good place for parentheses to come in. Okay, two, there'll be, le and by the way, there'll be less explanation on these going forward. You can look in my other video on this section if you want, or just try to work these out. Go back to Hurley, and let me just do this once for you. So in this section, sorry if this kills your eyes. Let me just scroll all the way up. Um, so what you're going to do, yeah, right here. So what you're going to do is be looking at section, um, forget if this is 6.2, yeah, 6.1. You're going to be looking at how, sorry, how he uses the English, commas, and, but, howevers, and how he translate, how he translates. But for some, for most of you, the tricky part will be down here because we're using parentheses. So read through these, see where he, or see how he translates it. If he uses a comma or if he doesn't, see how, you know, maybe there's a pause in the sentence a certain way. And then, so he'll use parentheses a certain way. So go back to page 333 or in your mind tab books, this section right here. I think it'll really help you. And you can look at these two. The tildes will, will get some of you. Um, so look at how he says not both or either or, you know, not. Look where he places the either ors and the nots and see how he uses his parentheses. Okay, so we're going back into um, 
this. Number two. So you can push pause, try to work this out. If Movado offers a blue dial, then neither fossil is water resistant nor Nautic promotes a titanium case. Um, and the answer is D. So you gotta you gotta look where he says neither nor, neither nor. And when he does neither nor, the way he does it, there's a parenthesis on the outside, or a, uh, a negation on the outside of the parentheses. So two is D. Three. Um, you can push pause and try to work this out. Three is A. And, of course, look at the language. You know you have an if. And sometimes you won't even have the then, but the then's implied. So you know if you have an if, no matter what, you know you're going to have a um, conditional symbol in here. So the second you see if, you look for the symbol, automatically you know that B and D are out. They're gone. Because you have, you have to have the symbol. So now you're looking at A, C, and E. So look at these questions as elimination. Like eliminate the worst two or three right off the bat. And then focus in on the other remaining. So again, that's A, four. Got a semicolon, so you know that's a huge pause there. So it could be that um, there's you know parentheses from here on. So this is E, and just exactly what I was telling you. Gucci features stainless steel. Boom. There's a huge pause because of the semicolon. So it seems like G is hanging outside somewhere, well, that's exactly what it's doing. So now you have the choice between E and C, right? And this just happens to be, you have to figure out which one goes first, the F or the C. Um, so you have to look at, given that, you have to look at that language, given that, go back to that section, So this is the tricky one. We don't see given that. You do see it down at the end of your chapter in the summary section. So let me just work, oh sorry. So given that, Cartier stops the watch. So given that, you can put that as whenever you see given that, whatever is after that is automatically the antecedent, okay? So anytime you see something, something given that, Whatever is to the right of it is the antecedent, which means it's reversed. So C comes first. Because if you were to try to symbolize this, you might say F horseshoe, because you see given that C. So you might say F horseshoe C. But you know when you see given that, it's referring to the antecedent. So the C goes before the F. And that's why it's E. Okay? So quite simply, I've just showed you that in your book you have one two three four five six different choices you have to see how they're using the language and how they're translated and i've given you a seventh why because now you have the given that okay so some of you will struggle with this make sure you look at that um page in your book sorry i get these ads that pop up they're totally annoying okay um five we have an if and only if. Ooh. Now, when you see an if and only if, what symbol is that? Correctamundo. That is a triple bar, which means C, D, and E are gone. C, D, and E drop right off, and it's a choice between A and B. And you can look at the um, translation here. How many of you thought it was B? It is. Y, Avado, and Nautica. And Avado and Nautica offer a black dial if and only if pigeon i don't know how to i don't know how to pronounce that it looks french but i'm going to say pigeon it might be piaget who knows <laughs> all right so five is b six i'll let you work this out and here we go with the answer six is e 
you can look at that. There's a lot going on here. So you want to pay attention to the two commas. They're probably going to set off two types of, okay, so you have parentheses and then you have brackets. I know this is tough. I know it is. Um, you won't have a lot of these on your, you probably have one or two of these long ones on your test. Um, but go back and look at the book or, or look at this one and see how he's using commas in the language and how he's translating. Um, but like I said, very first thing you want to do is look at if, then, either, or. Got an if, then, either, or, if, then, either, or. So I have no dots in there, so I can't really eliminate. So yes, this one has three horseshoes, but I have an either, or. So that eliminates this one because I know I have to have a wedge symbol in there, right? And it eliminate, uh, I don't know if it eliminates D because you do have a wedge. So you have to work out if D works or not. But bottom line, um, it's E7 provided that. Ooh, there's that language provided that. Some of you will struggle with the conditional symbols and how it's worded. So you could simply go back to that section provided that brown does so when you see provided that brown does the b comes later so it looks like it would be a, a consequent and this would be the antecedent but whenever you see provided that it's reversed whatever comes after the provided that b is reversed and it's the antecedent okay so pay pay particular attention to that language because it's showing up right here so that will help you on one of these translations so the answer is a um eight these last few i'll go over quickly because we're going to go into a new section so eight is d you can work that out once again d nine we have sufficient and necessary condition four. We have that very specific language that shows up. We know we're gonna have a triple bar. So it's gonna be, you could rule out B right away. There's no triple bar. Okay, so work out the language and the answer is C. Look at your tildes, look at your wedge. 10, <clears throat> we have an if and only if. We have, Wow, this is a lot going on here. This is like the hardest one. You could try to work this out, and the answer is E. You have a semicolon. Um, so it seems like the semicolon could show right up in the middle here. And we know that however is language for a dot, not a wedge. So you could look at this whole thing and say, it seems like this whole thing's separated by this gigantic Oh, sorry, this, this very distinct separation, like the semicolon, right? And right after it is this, however, how do we translate that? We know it's a dot. So that rules out D. D's gone, so now it's A, B, C, or E. So there's little tricks like that. You just start ruling it out. Um, so this answer is E. Um, 11 and 12, and you may have answers or questions like this on MindTap. Um, they're... Give me a second here. Yeah, so let's go with 11. And this, this quite honestly, is pretty easy. A and B are true. X and Y are false. So anytime you see an A or a B, put T in there. So like T, T, this is F, T, F, T. And you just substitute the letters for the truth values, and then you solve. So this is where you actually have to know, you know, how do I solve for this? when you have a dot symbol. And by the way, go back to this section, review this if you struggle with this. I won't go through all the details here because I have another video that does this for you. Um, but now you're having to solve. So just on one of these, on the dot, both sides have to be true for the whole thing to be true. Um, and, you know, there you go. So anyways, then you have to solve all the way down to the end. And is this whole statement um, true or false? It is. A, which is true. Uh, this is these are easy uh, in problem eleven. So going back up to this one, the main operator is what's the main operator in this whole thing? Well, how many of you said tilde over here? Yeah, you know that's not right. 
How many of you said tilde here? Ah, uh, that's not right either. That 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 governs this whole thing in the brackets. How many of you said triple bar? Correct. It's C, triple bar. 13, same as 11. Anytime you have a X or a Y, you put F. Anytime you have an A or B, you, you put T. So substitute all these letters for their truth values. Solve. what? And just to help you, well, no, because that's 14. We'll just go there in a second. But solve all this, and what's the answer? It is B. The whole thing is false. And then, of course, this is the easier part. So let's say even if you stumbled on 11 solving the whole thing, or even if you stumbled on 13 solving it, 12 and 14 are ridiculously easy because you're just asking, uh, you're just asking you what's the main operator. You know that's a triple bar, so you get points there. What's the main operator here? Well, I have two huge, you know, things I have to work out in the brackets. So over here, over here, and how many of you got that as the main operator? That's the right answer, the horseshoe. Okay, so I believe those sets are pretty easy. Again, if you like mathematics and you like solving problems and just plugging away, you know, just take whatever your A and B are, put T, T there, T there, F there, F there, T there, there T there, and just, you know, solve. So, um, Using ordinary truth tables, that's right. So you might have sections in MindTap where you have, um, it's giving you, it's weighted. It's saying, hey, for 15 and 16, this is going to be a lot more um, point value. So whatever you get for 15, that's exactly what you're going to put for 16. So it's going to count you double, double the credit here. So if you get this wrong, you're automatically getting 16 wrong. So you got to get both right. Um, how do we do this? Construct truth tables. How many letters are there? How many different letters are there? And again, you can go back to my other video on this. There's two, right? N, K. How many lines on the truth table? I'll go to that section with you. I believe it's 6.3. Let's get through this. Yeah, so right here. Section 6.3, how many uh, different propositions? There was two, right? So how many lines on the truth table? Four. So you know you're going to have four lines on this truth table when you solve this out. And again, this is review. If there's uh, four lines on the truth table, the first one is true, true, false, false. The next one is true, false, true, false. Okay, it's the same. So true, false, true, false. True, true, false, false. All the way across, the main operator, solve it. And so we're looking for the statement itself. And there's three possible answers. Contingent means you have at least one truth and one false. Inconsistent means all of them are false. So lines one, two, three, and four, you have false, 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 false. That's inconsistent. If you have all trues, which one would it be? Tautologous. So what do you get for this? Contingent. So that means you at least have one T and one F in there in your four possible answers. Again, you can look at this. Again, go back. When you um, look at your lines on the truth table, we're in this section classifying statements, and he's telling you right there what they are. If they're all false, um, you know, they're inconsistent. That would be contingent because at least, oh, sorry, that'd be a uh, tautologous all true. And at least one true and at least one false contingent. Then we're going to go into comparing statements. Now you're going to have two main operators, and then you're going to compare them going across. You're going to have, you know, different choices. For this one, I'll go there, just so you're not confused. Oh, yeah. So on this one, you're going to... So when you got A, contingent, you're going to pick A for this one as well. And then is, you know, there's another question on truth table in 15. How many lines in the truth table? Well, we just did that. How many lines? Four, because there's two propositions, right? So four. B is the right answer. So one problem here, you've got three ways to get points on this guy. 
Um, let's go to this one. Given the statement, the statement is how many letters are in here? We have a G and a Q, G and a Q. So we have two propositions. How many lines in the truth table? Four, right? So we got four lines on the truth table. So G is true, true, false, false. Q is true, false, true, false. Q is true, false, true, false. G is true, true, false, false. Start solving for these guys. Get your main answer here on the main operator. And what was it? It was C, tautologist. That means all these are true. You should see four trues, okay? Um, for example, if you had three trues and one false, that one false, you've done something wrong when you solve. This should all be true. Select the same answer for 18. So if I got C, put C for 19. Okay, so more points. Um, this one's a little bit hairier because, you know, how many lines on this truth table? Well, how many propositions are there? Or how many letters are there? H, E, D. Three different letters. How many lines on the truth table? Eight. Correct. If you said four, go back and look. If there's three propositions, there's eight lines in the truth table. If there's four propositions, which is really a long one, there's 16 lines on the truth table. That's huge. And if there's two propositions, there's four lines. Okay, so this one has eight lines. Go ahead and solve it. What's your main operator here? Correct. Triple bar. So when you're done solving this, all eight lines should have self-contradictory. That means all eight lines will have a false. All eight lines have F, okay? Select the same answer. So you're going to put um, E because you have E for 20. You're going to put E for <coughs> same thing. And again, this is a mock exam. These are not the actual answers for your exam. This is a mock exam. This is just, you know, review here. You're going to have a totally different exam showing up on your um, canvas through MindTap. Uh, truth table in problem 20 has how many lines? Well, we just did that one. Eight. Now we're doing pairs of statements again. This is where in this section, <coughs> comparing statements. And what, what's usually going to happen is you're either going to have one of these two answers, and if you don't, then you're going to have one of these two answers. And Hurley says that. You can go back and do your reading. So it's going to be one of those two or one of these two. It's either going to be logically equivalent or contradictory or consistent or inconsistent, okay? So logically equivalent, you can look at this. That means if I have a T, I'm going to have a T here, F, F there, T, T here. Everything's the same. Contradictory, if I have a T, or whatever I have here, I'm going to have the opposite going over. Consistent means that at least once I have both truths, and then, um, you know, I could have a true and false, and a false and a false, but at least once, at least once, I have a true and a true, so it's consistent. Inconsistent, um, and you can read this, so... There's no line in the columns in which the main or operators are both true. So you're never going to have a T and a T going across. So it's inconsistent. Again, it's either going to be one of these two. And if you can't get one of these two, it's going to be one of these two. So that's review for you if you go back to that section. So the answer is, and again, how many lines in the truth table? Well, I have two letters or two propositions. So four lines on the truth table. So you can go ahead and main operator. Is this the main operator for this one? No, it's the tilde, right? Do all this first, then this will be the main operator. What's the main operator here? The dot. So solve all that, and the answer is D. It's consistent. Same answer, so I'm going to have to have D for this one. And again, you can do this, and um, I'll let you work this out, but 25 is, and you can push pause and try to do this on your own. 25 is A. So 26 is A. And last one, 27. You can work this out. It is B. So 28 is B. Okay. Um, now I believe we're into 6.4. Um, so again, how many premises are here? One premise, second premise, double slash means conclusion. Um, 
On these guys, the first thing you want to do is count how many letters or propositions there are, or different kinds. So we have a B and an M, O, oh, and a K. So we have three. Three lines on the truth table, or sorry, if we have three propositions, how many lines on the truth table? Eight. Eight lines. And what you want to do is find the line, if there's one that has, so you want to look for your answer. And, and by the way, go back to my video in 6.4. I do a few of these with you. So you want to see if you have, in your eight lines, if you have a true and a true and a false. Then you know the whole thing fails. It's invalid. And you should know what line it fails at. So if you go one through eight and you work this whole thing out, you'll know where you have a T and a T and an F. If you don't, every time you have true premises, you have a true conclusion, and you never see a false conclusion when you have true premises, then you know the whole thing's valid. Okay? So work this out. Push pause. Come back. And here is the answer for this. It is E. The whole thing's valid. That means every time we have true premises, we have a true conclusion. Okay? So the same answer for this one. So we have an E and an E. Do this. Um, same thing. How many letters or propositions? We have S, N, H. So there's three. How many lines in the truth table? Eight. Um, work them out. And I'm going to give you the answer. 31 is B. So on line two, so again, one through eight, there's eight lines in the truth table. On line two, you're going to have a true premise, true premise, and a false conclusion that happens in line two. So that makes the whole thing invalid. And, and the bigger picture with this, and you can look at this as 6.4, all it takes is one line to have both true premises and a false conclusion. Why? Because if something's valid, you will never have true premises and a false conclusion. It's actually impossible. So... If it's invalid, you'll be able to see at least one instance where it's how many ever premises there are. Here, there's two of them. Let's say there's one. Let's say there's 18. It doesn't matter. How many ever premises there are, you're looking for a line where they're all true and the conclusion's false. If you cannot find one and you have true premises, true premises, true conclusion, the whole thing's valid. So again, the answer is B for this, fails at line two, and B again. So Indirect truth tables on this one, um, we are not including this in your final, so disregard these. They're taken off. And now we're in this last section. Um, these, this is in 6.6. .6. You can go back to that video and review it. You're looking for pattern recognition, the forms, okay? And I told you back in that video, sometimes that looks like it's in the correct order. Every once in a while, you will have something like this, a smaller premise on the top and a bigger one on the bottom. Simply write it out over here again. Put this one on top, this one on the bottom. See if it looks better. Again, it's pattern recognition. Yeah, this one does it too, 48. Reverse them. Put this on top, that one on the bottom, and see if it looks like it um, is more recognizable to you. You're looking to see, does it have a very specific form? And if you didn't know where you were at in your book, so let's go down to 6.6. .6. Don't stroke out of me. Don't look at this while I'm, you know, going down these lines. But So on 6.6, .6, he goes over all the forms with you. He names them. But I'm just going to bring you to a really cool little section that has them all right in front of you. Okay? I'll show you right now. Right here. Ding dong. Modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive, C, D, D, D. All of these are valid. You're looking for this type of form. I told you in my video for 6.4 that it could be A, B, C, Q, R, S. It could be any letters you want. They just have to match up consistently like they do here. These are the two bad forms. They actually have names. And there's a third bad form that I told you about that doesn't have a name. It's, it looks like it's a disjunctive syllogism, but it's not because something's not being negated the right way. So anyways, there's nine things you're looking for. Here's six good ones, which are valid forms. Two bad ones, which have unique forms and they have names for them. And then there's a, a ninth that doesn't have a name, but it looks like disjunctive syllogism. Okay, so quite simply, it could be P or Q, 
And then I could put like um, Q down here and there's no negation. And then I could say P. It looks like a disjunctive syllogism, but it's invalid because there's no negation. Even though, you know, this one in the book has a negation. So again, go back to that video. Um, so you have nine, no, you have eight forms. Six are good, two are bad. And then you have one that doesn't have a, uh, it looks like it has a form, but it just has no name. So, again, if you're confused on that a little bit, I'll show you. So on this one, look at it. What form does it look like? Is it valid or invalid? Push pause, work these out. D, modus tollens. So you have an if then, you're negating the consequent, therefore you negate the antecedent. That is a perfectly valid form. How do we know this? If you were to run a truth table on this, um, you would never get a line on your truth table where the premises are true and the conclusion's false. Premises, if you have them true, the conclusion's always true. That's why it's valid. 42. Oh, this looks like a long one, right? So it looks like it could be a possible um, constructive dilemma or destructive dilemma. So you're going you're gonna to look for horseshoes, a dot up here, horseshoes, a dot up here, and then a wedge below. You know, that looks like the pattern. Do we have that? Ah, so we don't have horseshoes up here, right? So this whole thing was B invalid. It looks like it's one of those two, but again, again, they both have horseshoes in the top. And this one doesn't. Okay. 43. Um, you can work this one out. Yeah, they both have horseshoes. They have it. We have a dot there. We have a wedge here. Could it be a CD or a DD? It is a DD valid. You can look at this um, if you want to in the book. And again, Hurley tells you you can reverse these two, the not T and the T, to make it line up with this. He gives you a law for that. Where's it at? Uh, uh, it might be down here. I think it's down. And we see the same six here and the other two here. Uh, where is it? Yeah, right there is. Uh, cumulativity. So you can, like, like, P or Q is the same thing as Q or P. So if you want to reverse those looking at these problems, or P is logically equivalent to not not P. He says you can use these two laws to reformulate these to make sure they work. And again, you can reverse this to make sure it lines up the same way. But again, this is destructive dilemma. It's valid. 44. Try to work this out on your own. This is C. Denying the antecedent, it's invalid. So I have a conditional, I try to deny this or take the opposite, and then I try to deny that, it doesn't work. So go back to that section of the book. This one, I would take this, put it on the bottom of this, then look at it again to see if you get better pattern recognition. And this one is A, modus ponens, okay? Modus ponens. Again, not S, conditional F, put on the bottom not s so it goes under it and then you have your f um more simply reverse it to see if it looks like it could be you know one of these guys i have a conditional on top i reverse it i put this other smaller premise on the bottom you're doing this because you want to see hey does it look like it could be modus ponens modus tollens or denying the antecedent or affirming the consequent the conditionals are on top there, and this minor premise is on the bottom there. So you're flipping it to see if you can recognize one of those. So again, answer is A, modus ponens. 46, I have a wedge. Looks like it's a disjunctive syllogism. Looks like it is, right? Is it? No, because you're missing the negation in the second premise. This one doesn't have a specific name, whereas these two guys that are invalid, they have names, you know, or let's go back. So 
These two invalid ones they actually have names. And remember I told you, so there's two bad ones, six good ones, and I told you, so there's eight total, and I told you there's a ninth, but it doesn't have a name, but it looks like this one. It looks like this, but it's not. Well, here it is. What's the difference? This one doesn't have a negation. But if you look at the disjunctive syllogism, it has to have a negation in the second premise. So, there you go. All things invalid. 47. That's a monster. We got three horseshoes. Again, you could take this horseshoe and put it on the bottom of that. You could reverse these two, the commutativity law, to see if it looks like it makes sense. And the answer is E. It is a hypothetical syllogism. Now this one's easy, you don't have to reverse it. Not J, then my C, I have my C's line up. I have my T, so I have not J, not T. Go back to 6.4, my video on this, if you want more help, or previous videos where I cover that. But if you're looking for that pattern, again, it doesn't matter that there's a negation there. It just matters that whatever I have here can't be the same as this one, so they're opposite. Okay, no problem. Whatever I have here has to link up with this one. Whatever I have here has to be different, so then I can conclude both of these. And again, over here, that's what he's doing, but he has different letters. There's no negations, but that doesn't matter. I have a P, my Q's line up, I have an R, so I can conclude P, therefore R. Okay? So, there you go with that. We're almost done here. Thanks for hanging in there. 48. You can put this on the bottom and then tell me if it if it matches a, a form that you're familiar with. And it does. Affirming the consequent, so that's invalid. And again, you could see it right here in a different way. Affirming the consequent is using different letters. So I have a P, then a Q. I'm affirming the consequent Q, then I'm concluding the antecedents, you know, the conclusion. That whole thing's invalid. What does that mean? If you were to run a truth table on these two, you would actually find on one of those lines two true premises, and on the conclusion, there would be one instance where it would be false. That's why it would be invalid. So 49, you could put this guy on the bottom of this. You can reverse these two if you want. But anyways, put premise one and two, reverse them, map it out, see what you get. And the answer is B, <laughs> constructive dilemma. Constructive dilemma. So again, he's got a different constructive dilemma here. He's using different letters. So you'll have a very similar pattern to this one here. Again, he has negations here, but in the book, we don't have negations. doesn't matter. It's the same pattern, okay? 50, class 1. I have a... Um, K, wedge, not B. Now, remember what I told you? I don't have a negation here, so it looks like it'd be invalid. Aha, but, but, isn't it negating this one up here? This is a not B, so it's the opposite of it. Yes, so it seems like there is a negation here implied, even though it doesn't have the symbol T. So it turns out that this is a destructive syllogism, or a um, disjunctive syllogism. And... For this one, you could put not, not, B. Because remember, he says, um, I just had it up above here. Oh, down here. So, double negation. So, P is equal to not not p, right? So p is equal to not not p. So I could use this double negation law to translate this. Um, and that simply means I have b could be not not p, so one negation, second negation. So it turns out, yes, it looks like I have negations down here. And that's the whole point of this. So. I have a not B, so then I have a not not B, they negate each other out, then I have a K, so the whole thing's valid. Okay, so that is pretty much in essence, and there's another mock exam, but we don't have to review that one. This is in essence what you have for your um, exam material. Again, in each section, if you want more help, go look back at that section. 
Um, and that's pretty much it. Good luck on your final exam.